Welcome to our podcast, A Novel Talk, co-hosted by Carl Lee, and I'm Wendy Kendall. My mystery book, Cat Out of the Bag, that's cat with a K, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all over. Katherine Watson, a purse designer and amateur sleuth, goes from designer bags to body bags when she's faced with a murder mystery. Thank you to all the readers who've let me know how much they enjoyed the book and also the prequel, Perstachio Makes a Splash. Catherine and Mayor Brenda Derling investigate a chilling cold case. The sequel is coming and later this year, a new novella too. And here comes your co-host. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I'm one of those fans who uh, liked uh, your first two books. I can't wait to read book three and the um, uh, novella. Um, my name, as Wendy said, is Carl Lee, and I write paranormal fantasy, so I'm very excited to have Robert as our guest. Um, <laughs> um, my current project is uh, hopefully under final revision before presenting to the publishers. Our guest today has pursued many interests over the years, but the supernatural kept calling to him. Readers are thrilled that finally he decided to write The Idola Project, based on an idea he had as a teenager. And the best news is that this is a series, and the sequel is available too, Moonlight Becomes You. Welcome award-winning author Robert Harold, and thank you for joining us on A Novel Talk. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So um, I was fortunate enough to read uh, Moonlight Becomes You, um, and in that, uh, in that novel you use several archaic words. Um, such as uh, Faldera and Skedaddle, those are the ones that come to mind, um, which help the rem which help remind the reader of the time period that um, the story is set in. Um, uh, that's not a question. That's just an uh, amiable observation. Um, <laughs> the question is: um, Is it difficult to write um, within such a strong historical context because you just everything about the time period? is so vivid. Well, thank you. I'm honored to hear that. Uh, I am particularly attracted to this time period. and uh, But as a, a writer for today's audience, it's a dance you have to do. You have to suggest the time period, help to bring it to life without uh, going overboard and alienating people who won't understand slang and references that are too obtuse. So again, it's a uh, it's to suggest and to bring that time period to life without without losing today's audiences. Mm -hmm. Well, the Idola project is written in the period 1885. What is it that appealed to you about that time in history for this paranormal story? Well, the uh, the era was a very dynamic one and it was uh, we were on the cusp of the modern age and there was a lot of social issues that they were coming to terms with and grappling with that actually mirror a lot of what we're dealing with today and in fact those issues are uh, prevalent in my novels and those include racism and drug abuse and sexism and bigotry and so uh, it's a fun way to have kind of a distant mirror and reflect back on the issues that we're still grappling with. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and speaking of mirrors, you have a knack um, for balancing positive emotions like love against um, the the evil present in Petersburg. Um, I, I, I would like to know how, how mortal evil differs from supernatural evil. Well, I think, or does it? Well, <laughs> it. Well, both think they're the hero of their own stories, and they both mm -hmm. are Im 
imposing their agenda on others at their at others expense and their right to life and liberty and again the pursuit of happiness are 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 totally extraneous to the um, the one who is the evil with the evil intent and again that uh, that that notion of empathy and and coming to terms with the you know our, our own frailties and foibles uh-huh. are uh, I think what helps to enrich a story but again these are issues that are are prevalent in today's society as they were in the past and yeah. you know, not that much different than we were the supernatural is just uh, for me a wonderful vehicle to reflect uh, uh, on these things in a fun and exciting way oh I agree <laughs> It is, it is such a fun read, too, as you're going through it. Y- your character, Sarah, is a young girl with supernatural powers. And as in the Idola Project, as, as we start out, we, uh, we hear her story. And part of it is how she ends up as part of a circus act. Can you tell us a little bit about your character, Sarah, and how you came to create her with the powers that she has. Well, Sarah, I, I was a, a, a public school teacher for uh, for many, many years. And, you know, sometimes I've, I've noticed that the, uh, the slight frail people have an inner dynamism and power that just needs to be tapped into and to help them realize it and it was one of my missions as a teacher was to do that and so I imagine Sarah initially being buffeted about by abused parents and you know she falls into you know she's basically sold to a circus but she achieves some good fortune in being uh, mentored by this woman who uh, cares about him her and helps her to uh, recognize her gifts and and grow as an individual and also helps to educate her as she has a book a uh, trunk full of classic books that she said uh, those those writers would be her teacher and so she ends up being um, kind of a remarkable person who comes into her own but she given her background and what had happened to her she's desperate to find a place to belong and and, and so she creates in a way with the Idola project and find, once she finds these people, um, she creates a new family in that. And uh, it was, a, again, a real drive for her. And it's something that she still has to come to terms with. Her, um, she, she feels deeply and that is something that it sometimes gets her into trouble and is uh, in her channeling through her being a medium. She is sometimes tortured by the experiences, and yet she feels it's important to do that. And uh, sometimes entities and individuals will manipulate her, her caring nature and her empathy to, again, to their own ends. And so she, she's a fascinating character, one who I really like. I like them all, actually. <laughs> I, I love them all, but, uh, but she is particularly... Um, just yeah an amazing she's lovable and yet also she's she's just so unique but like you say I can hearing your background with the teaching and everything and sort of being able to study um maybe like still waters run deep is what Mm -hmm. leaps to my mind um you really embody that still waters run deep in that character specifically, it's really well done. She she oh. is very lovable. Oh, again, thank you so much. Yeah, Wendy, and you'll love her in um, Moonlight as well. She's uh, just a fantastic character. Um, yeah, I've to- noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that um, all of the team members. Speaking of Sarah, all of the team members have um, limitations on their abilities. Um, that that. They're, they seem to be self-imposed shackles preventing them from being able to tap their full um, a- uh, access to their abilities. Um, why do you think people put up um, barriers like that to prevent themselves from um, realizing their full potential? 
It's a uh, it's a conundrum that I think uh, a lot of people face that they uh, they prevent themselves from achieving some of their uh, or, or or actualizing their gifts, and it's again a loss to both themselves and others for them doing so. And I think what's happened in the Adola project, the the, the group within the story. Uh, they are finding their way and 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 learning to support each other. Yeah, each of them has flaws, uh, but each of them has strengths. Mm -hmm. And in the course of the stories, uh, the novels, they will um, help each other to recognize those and 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 develop them. Nigel Pickford, for example, is a He's a racist and he was a drunk, and uh, there was some reasons for for that. And one of the themes in the story is his evolution as a as an individual to recognize the the flaws of his thinking and helping him to become, frankly, a better person. Yeah, um, I liked the glimpse into his uh, backstory that we have in uh, Moonlight. Well, thank you. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> From your first book, I found out that the word idola is an ancient Greek word for ghosts. But the team who are on the idola project broadened their scope because they are motivated to investigate all things supernatural. Um, and sort of what, uh, along the lines of what Carl was talking about, I noticed too that each member of the team has some characteristic that segregates or even completely outcasts them from the society of the era. Um, so you've talked a little bit about that, but can you tell us um, some more about characteristics in a couple of these um, team members that aid in their work and also have the potential to bring this group, this team together as a true team, if they don't kill each other first. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, uh, again, I, I was taking different talents and, uh, and individuals that I thought could also reflect some of the uh, social milieu that was happening at the time period. And it, it was a a period of, of uh, nascent feminism with the uh, the suffrage movement and the temperance movement and uh, uh, women striving for a, a more prominent role in society. And Annabelle Douglas, uh, who is the, uh, she leads the group in the field and is second in command. She, she doesn't have any extraordinary uh, supernatural abilities but she is very bright and she is able to sort of direct this motley crew uh -huh. when uh when the professor uh william james who was actually a real character uh and i'll speak about him in a moment uh, when he's not there william james incidentally is uh, a, a true individual and he was the father of american psychology and was actually really into investigations of the supernatural and I read a, a marvelous nonfiction book called Ghost Hunters by Deborah Blum. And uh, it sort of sparked my thinking that, uh, oh, you know, maybe he could start this little splinter group and go off and get caught up in investigations of the supernatural. And uh, so I've, uh, I've been having a lot of fun with that. That's fascinating. I didn't realize that about that character. That uh, interesting. That is interesting. Um, in in both of the uh, novels in the Idola Project, but specifically in Moon, Moonlight Becomes You, um, there are multiple supernatural characters. There are werewolves, there are witches, there are psychics, or mediums. Um, could you share with us when and where your interest in the supernatural came from? <laughs> Probably from the womb. I, uh... <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's where mine came from. <laughs> uh, I've always had it, a fascination with uh, the supernatural. You know, a lot of kids wanted to grow up to be, you know, doctors and lawyers and f firemen and candlestick makers and what have you. I wanted to be a werewolf, and uh, <laughs> it was my biggest passion. I would practice howling at the moon, and when uh, it would snow, I would go out 
halfway into neighbors' lawns making footprints, and then I would make little paw prints as far as my arms would reach and I would stretch out and then work my way back through the paw prints and the footprints uh, and then fetch neighbor kids and point out and say, look, someone has turned into a werewolf in your front, front lawn. <laughs> and uh, how they were skeptical, but <laughs> I still had fun. <laughs> so I think this is just a, a logical extension of that fascination I had as a child. And I think it's, you know, a, a, a child's attempt to uh, have power in a sense of wild abandon that comes with such a monster. Uh, but uh, I have a lot of fun as I uh, explore that kind of side side to myself and uh, and that passion I had for a kid, and I still do. Well, that's excellent. I had a similar, I had similar upbringing. <laughs> Okay, awesome. now I'm picturing both of you uh, walking on your hands <laughs> in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> your action scenes are tremendous. I'm reading them with all the lights on, the doors locked, my back against the wall, my eyes wide open and forgetting to breathe without giving away your skillful plotting. What is most important to you when writing your high action scenes? Well, first of all, thank you so much for that lovely compliment. <laughs> I'm sorry I scared you sheepless. <laughs> yes, I but, know. Uh, it was so uh, good. It was a scary in a good way. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> well, I think I, you know, I think it is sort of like the roller coaster uh, effect that horror engenders, and if you can can do that it's it's a lot of fun and it's a success um i'm a very visual writer i'm imagining it as a movie in my head as i'm trying to capture it in words and uh, i have a tendency sometimes to race through the scene too fast and so after my initial draft i always go back and and try to really mine it for details and to uh, really help the reader feel and sense it in you know in all the sensory ways and uh, but maintaining a, a, a level of action and pacing that will propel the the reader to turn from page to page well well done is what i say <laughs> i was taking yeah, I notes i'm going to use some of your strategy on my action scenes <laughs> <laughs> yes well done however i did not need the lights on to uh read the book. <laughs> <laughs> i i love horror uh, <laughs> um so um you had you touched on this earlier but um dr edgar gilpin and Nigel appear to be at odds throughout most of Moonlight Becomes You. Um, could you expand on their relationship without giving anything away from book three? Because I haven't read it yet. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> coming um, soon. <laughs> coming soon, yes. <laughs> so, uh, well, Edgar is uh, an African-American and he is um, he's brilliant and he's one of the first African-American uh, physics graduates um, to achieve a, um, a doctorate. And he, it, once he achieves that, though, he runs into lots of difficulty finding a, a place to teach at a university. And he falls in with the Idola Project, and he brings a, um, well, kind of a, um, steampunkish flavor because he is in, also an inventor and in trying to do various things to help with the investigations and so there's a little bit of that but it's certainly not a steampunk um, novel but there's a little bit of that with with uh, with Edgar and Edgar is uh, someone who is also uh, you know very strong and he also is strong-willed and has a temper and so there's there is that. Now you put that up against Nigel, who is someone who uh, fought for the Confederacy, is, is racist, and uh, he also has a lot of personal flaws uh, associated with his having been an uh, being an alcoholic, and 
is uh, not having any compunction about, uh, you know, saying I'm toward and inappropriate <laughs> things. Yeah, not only for the time period, but also for today. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's meant to be a clash. But they also learn to, um, you know, appreciate things about themselves that will get get revealed. And that, again, wait. that's part of the story arc that will be happening. Can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> Have you ever had any supernatural experiences yourself that you're willing to share with our listeners? Well, not personally, although um, something semi supernatural in the sense that uh, uh, I have a brother who uh, I donated a kidney to and when his kidney failed years ago he, he was um, delirious at his house and he um, he nearly died well my mom just had an inkling that there, there was something wrong and he had said that you know, he had not been feeling well when he had talked with her last and said that um, you know, if he was feeling better uh, later in the evening he was going to go to a party well she tried calling him back later in the evening and he wasn't answering the phone and um, and at the time she wasn't driving and her husband was um, an upholsterer and he had a big project he needed to finish and he thought oh he's, he's at the party he didn't want to take her uh, I, did I mention she didn't drive and she needed him to drive and he wanted to finish this project well he, he finally finished it around midnight and and said all right I'll take you uh, but he, he was very reluctant when they pulled up to his house it was totally dark and he said oh see he's not there he's got a party and my mom insisted on going to the door and they pounded on it and uh, he staggered down the stairs his lips were black and his his body was jerking with electrolytes being totally out of whack because his kidneys had failed and um, my mom said look you're coming to a fest to the hospital or I'm calling 911 and the, the doctor said had they waited much longer he would have been dead so oh, my wow. mom's intuition um, ended up saving his life and wow. uh, uh, so it's it kind of remarkable and I've talked with a number of other people about experiences that they may have had or that they know about a, um, my neighbor, who is a uh, rather renowned National Parks historian, uh, historian Alfred Rente, uh, used to be a professor at the University of Washington as well. Um, when he was turning 50, he happened to be back on the East Coast, and he decided to, to stay up until his actual birth time, which was uh, 2.08 in the morning. And so he was... Uh, he had a suite where he was staying at the time he was doing some work for the National Parks Association and um, he fell asleep and he woke up and uh, the clock said uh, 2.30 and he, he was thinking, oh shoots, I missed my actual birth time uh, that he was going to celebrate and, and then he started to hear this um this little robin twitter and uh he he searched all over the the suite he couldn't find it he went out onto the the little balcony and it was it was in the middle of the night and there was no birds about and trees were uh 30 feet down and he was up on the i think eighth sixth or eighth floor or something like that and he, he couldn't couldn't locate it but it was a robin's uh, trill that he was hearing and his, his mother's favorite bird was the robin and oh wow uh, his and and the bird kept on tweeting until it became uh 308 and then it was suddenly silent and he realized that it was um 308 uh, was the daylight savings time time but back at the time he was born in 1947 daylight savings time didn't start until later and so actually 
he was awake at the time of his actual birth 50 <gasps> years earlier. Later that day, he goes to his, his hometown, and as he is approaching the cities up on the hill, he's seen, uh, he, he would like to sort of spot his house, you know, three miles distant, and uh, as sort of a little touchstone kind of experience as he was coming over the hill. And he noticed his house was brightly lit up, and he couldn't figure out why. Uh, the sun was in a different direction, so it couldn't have been reflecting off of the house. He he ends up driving to the house and and checking it out. And the owners, he had just sold the house the year before. The owners weren't home. But he, he noticed that there was kind of um, uh, a, a kind of a spotlight, but it was shining on the on the house, but it didn't seem bright enough to have lit up the house and you know to be seen several miles away. So it seemed like just an odd experience. But his mom used to always say whenever he was coming home from college or working late that I'll leave the light on for you. Mm. And uh, a few days later he decided to, to, to go by the house and, and introduce himself to the new owners. And he mentioned that uh, he came by and uh, he, he mentioned that the light was on and he kind of appreciated that and mentioned the story about his mom uh, always leaving the light on for him and he, uh, and he said well the new owner said well that that light is has been burned out and I and I noticed that the fixture had come loose and it was pointing at the um, the front porch in a way that it normally doesn't and it, uh, that's just totally bizarre because the light is burned burned out it's been burned out for a few weeks and I've been meaning to fix it I love that. Wow. Yeah, that's a great story. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, that's such a positive supernatural. I love that. Yeah. And speaking of great stories, Robert, uh, would you mind reading an excerpt from Whoa. one of your books for our readers? Awesome. I would be. Turn the lights on, Wendy. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read a few pages from The Idola Project. Yay. This is chapter six, and it's set in Atlanta, and the year is 1885. When Madame Dobrescu, a fat medium, slumped forward on her chair, rivulets of sweat ran down the sides of her flabby face, dripped from her nose, and formed a puddle on the polished oak floor. No wonder. The crowded room was stifling. Summers in Atlanta often become oppressively hot and this evening's thunder shower only increased the humidity. The draped windows and the backdrop of black curtains behind the medium made things worse. No air circulated. Seated men and women filled the room, anxious to see what would happen next. They were overdressed for the heat, but a, but a society affair required one, that one need to maintain certain pretensions. Their shiny faces and drooling hairdos drooping hairdos uh, indicated the price they paid in addition to admission. In the front row, Annabelle Douglas and Sarah Bradbury fanned themselves with their programs. Within the folds of the makeshift fans, the text promised an extraordinary exhibition of supernatural power by Madame Dobrescu. Sarah had only limited abilities to foresee events. Nonetheless, she felt tonight would be very different, a very different show. She also sensed that they would find the man who had haunted her sleep, someone who might save her life. That aspect alone convinced Professor James to pay for the trip and allow Annabelle and Edgar to accompany her. But Sarah could only provide his name, a vague description, and the sense that he would be here tonight. Sarah, Annabelle, and Edgar arrived early. A black servant ushered the two women into the front row but he insisted Edgar stand in the rear, although empty chairs filled the room. So much for Southern hospitality, Sarah said. Annabel hushed her. This sort of thing rankled Sarah, but she also knew Edgar could have been banned from the place altogether. In the ensuing half hour, the room filled with patrons. Relegated to the rear, Edgar positioned himself near the double doors and queried each man who entered. No one answered to Nigel Pickford. Well-dressed men and women now filled the dimly lit room watching. 
Those seated in the back craned their necks to see, despite the sweltering heat. No one complained. Discomfort seemed a small inconvenience in order to communicate with the beyond. Behind the medium stood a tall mahogany cupboard. Sarah leaned over to Annabelle and whispered, that's where she keeps the best china for when the ghosts come to tea. Annabelle motioned for her to be quiet, but smiled nonetheless. Sarah stopped her flippancy and sat back with a start when the medium's rotund head came up to stare at the audience. The woman's eyes glowed green. Several women in the audience gasped, and even men made low utterances of surprise. The medium's arms rose before her as electricity danced between the palms of her hands. She stood and raised her charged hands above her head, then threw her arms wide. The room erupted in a flash of light with a deafening boom. The medium collapsed back onto the chair as a green spectral girl formed in the mist floating above her head. Mama, the girl wailed. Help me, Mama, it hurts. A bejeweled woman in black, three chairs to Sarah's right, jumped to her feet. Tears streamed down her face. It's her, she cried. Oh God, it's Mary. Standing, a bald man put a protective arm around the sobbing woman. The man looked up at the specter and then at the medium. His thick eyebrows knit together as he squeezed his eyes shut and fought back tears of his own. Uh, we'll pay whatever you ask. Just give our daughter peace. A faint smile passed over the medium's lips. Without warning, the entry doors behind the audience burst open like the gates of hell. A demonic figure in dark rags stormed into the room screaming. And we'll stop there. I love uh, that scene. <laughs> are you are you okay, Wendy? <laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> How can being so terrifying be so fun? I love it. <laughs> Robert, thank you for the reading. We I know I know Wendy and I appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners appreciate it as well. <laughs> well, you're most welcome. Yes, thank you so much, Robert Harold for joining us for a novel talk. We love the Idola Project and Moonlight Becomes You. Listeners, you will want to check out the website, robertheraldauthor.com. Harold is spelled H-E-R-O-L-D. You'll be rewarded with a free short story for visiting along with super information. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And remember, a novel read leads to a novel talk.